When I first discovered pleasure, I loved how it made me feel. It was like diving into a swimming pool on a hot summer day. I couldn't see much past the surface, so I started in the shallow end. But soon, I wanted more, and I did what most of us would do. I ventured out into the deeper end. And the further I wandered, the more I wanted. I began to immerse my whole self fully, completely, into the pleasure of the pool. And before long, every time I would visit the pool, I would dive in head first. After all, how can something that feels so good be bad for you? I would dive in, going beneath the surface, and just like being underwater, eventually I would have to come up for air. But the pool of earthly pleasure doesn't contain water. It has no stream to feed it, and there's no outlet. It is a stagnant pool, constantly collecting from those who visit it the densest form of gluttony, the slime of substance abuse, the fading luster of illicit sex, the pervasiveness of pornography, and the scattered imbalance of overindulgence. The pool was so thick that getting to the surface was a struggle. I kicked, I pulled, I reached for whatever I could grab just to try and get a breath of air. I was so swallowed up in the pleasure I was seeking that I couldn't breathe. Is that really what pleasure is supposed to do to you? In Revelation chapter 22, John describes a different body of water, a river containing the water of life as clear as crystal flowing straight from the throne of God. This river is cool, refreshing, and life-giving. Its crystal clear waters reveal exactly how polluted the pools of earthly pleasure really are. And if God's word is true, if the Lord wants good things for me, then this river is the water that I should drink from. This is the river where I should find my pleasure. This is the river that brings life to all who come to it. And in this river, I find greater joy greater fulfillment and greater pleasure than I have ever known. The stagnant pool that promised me pleasure only brought me closer to death. But the river that flows straight from the throne of God brings life. It satisfies in a way that no earthly pleasure can promise. And for that, I will dive in. So we've started this series called Breaking the Rules, and what we're talking about, the rules that we're breaking are the rules of the norm, what's become norm. And we're always creating a new norm, whether it's on purpose, intentionally, like I hope that's what you're doing in your life, it's always creating a new norm, or uh, it accidentally happens. You know, it just happens through society, doesn't it? Albert Einstein said, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and over again and expect a different result. And so we learn from God's word, and that's what we've been doing. We've been talking specifically in this series about, about uh, the church at Corinth, and the reason we are is because I think the American church is most like the church at Corinth. I mean, so many similarities, the, uh, the, the mindset and the culture of the church at Corinth in Greece was one of being a very wealthy. They had provision. They had most of their needs were met, and they had that one going on. They uh, took great pride in being educated. They really loved being philosophical and thinker, thinkers and debaters. Our society, if you know that, our educational system and the, the schools today are very much like that. And then the third part, and this is what we're going to talk about today, the third part is that they were very morally uh, off base a little bit, okay? They were off base, and much like our culture is off base a little bit. So we'll talk about that today. And uh, we have brought up, the first installment was about family. We've talked about the new norm for family, and we're going to go back to what family should be like. And then we talked about Baal worship, and we go, well, we were, we we're not Baal worshipers. And yet, yet when we discover what Baal is, 
Baal is uh, very prevalent here in our culture. Baal is simply relying on your own self, you know, and it is that power thing. And, uh, and so we're going to talk about this one today, and that one is the spirit of Asherah. Well, I don't worship Asherah. Yeah, maybe you don't worship via that name, but could it be that our culture, we know that it is, that our culture seeks pleasure above almost everything? And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But listen to what Paul said to the church at Corinth, because Paul wasn't coming down on them like, I want to teach you what religion is all about. And I I want to teach you, God, you're off base with God. That wasn't his heart at all. He's saying, look, some things have become normal. I want to help you get to the place of blessing. And that's my heart with this series. So uh, I've had several people stop me and say, thank you for teaching this stuff. Most people won't talk about the hard things. This is kind of hard because it's become normal in society. It's become normal in the church world today. But this is the way we are. We're going to bring the truth, but we're bringing it in love, not with condemnation and not with guilt or shame. We're bringing it to you with the spirit of love to say to you, hey, there's better for you. There's a future that's better for you if you'll just like do it God's way. And so listen to what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 1.18. The message about Christ's death on the cross is nonsense to those that are being lost. But for those of us that are being saved, it is God's power. The scripture says this, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and set aside the understanding of the scholar. So then, where does this leave the wise? Or where does it leave the scholar or that skillful debater of this world? God has shown that in the world's wisdom is foolishness. Verse 25 says this, this so-called foolish plan of God is so far wiser than the wisest plan of the wisest man. And God in his weakness, that moment when Christ was dying on the cross, his wisdom is so far ahead and so much greater than the wisdom of any man. So over in uh, 1 John, he talks about the three gods that we end up, you you know, Jesus was tempted. We talked about that last week. He was tempted in the three areas and the three categories, which we're talking about in this series. And in 1 John chapter 2, he talks about this. Don't love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, and here it is, this is everything in the world, the craving of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires, they're all going to pass away. In other words, that is not going to remain. But man who does the will of God will live forever. Sometimes we as Christians, we kind of freak out. And I've seen this growing up. You know, we, the church gets this us and them mentality going on. Like we're the Christians as if we're the good guys. The world is the bad guys. And the Lord is saying to us, hey, don't stress so bad on a us and them mentality because this mindset that the world has, they're going to come full circle. The scripture says, Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord and that his way is the way that works, not these other ways. Now, we don't know exactly when that's going to happen in everyone's life. Some of them, I think that will happen to them on the backside of it. But look, it's going to happen. And the piece is, is when you're right, you don't have to argue with everybody. You don't have to convince everybody. You don't have to fight about being right. You have to fight to stay in love. (laughs) Come on. The fight of faith. Your faith works by your love, by the way. So pride or the craving for more power, that is to be in control and call the shots, or pleasure, you know, the feel-good lust of the world. Romans chapter 1, and I've told you in the beginning of this series, the most controversial chapter in the Bible was Romans chapter 1. 
It said, for they knew God. If you stop and think about that for just a minute, especially in our culture today, they knew God. This country was founded on Christian principles as much as there's a big group today that want to deny that, but you can't change history. You can try to rewrite it, try to spin it, but the truth is the truth. This country was founded on these principles that God is God and that he lives For they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give thanks to him. Stop for just a second. Let's talk about just what worship is real quick. It's funny because we think worship is singing and raising our hands. I mean, that's our American definition of worship. Let's come together and let's worship the Lord. And that is an element of an expression, okay? But how many of you know you can come in here And you can clap your hands. You can move your feet. You can sing with your lips, but it can be only lip service. You can say the right things, but if it's not from the heart, and what true worship is, is when you humble yourself under the opinion of whatever you worship. So if you worship money, money says there's never enough right? And I got to hang on to all I've got. I'm afraid. What you worship, you typically fear. Worshiping money means the fear of loss. Worshiping power means you set aside your schedule at all costs. You uh, uh, liquidate family values to have more power. And maybe that's what leads to maybe workaholism, you know, where you uh, work more than you should. And then in this area that we're going to talk about today, pleasure is like, listen, life is short. I've got to feel good. I've got to feel good. And that's the lie of the enemy that we have. So they knew God and they began to think up in their mind foolish ideas. Now, this is what we see all around us, mostly in our media and in our public uh school systems. As a result, their minds became dark and they became confused. It was just, we're not mad at the media. We're not mad at the educational system. We're not mad. We're not. We love them. How many of you know schooling is good? Yes. Information is good. Yes. yes, we're not against that. Their minds became dark and they became confused. They claimed to be very wise they instead became utter fools. <laughs> I could go down that road, but this is not that message. As a result, they did fi- vile and degrading things with each other's bodies, and they traded the truth of God for a lie. And the reason that I want to talk about it, the reason that I want to go there with you is because your pastor loves you, and I really do want the best for you. So uh, all through the year, I talk about you guys finding your purpose in life, why God put you here. I talk about faith, how to build your faith to obtain the things and the success of God. We talk about that all the time, don't we? I, I, I encourage you with God's word. There's a better day. There's hope for you. But also I have to tell you this side of it because the things that I've been sharing with you are the roadblocks to your blessing. If you get caught up in the trap of the fear of money, you'll end up never being a tither or a giver. You'll be like in fear. Like, ooh, there's never gonna be enough. And your freedom financially is found in that thing. Don't teach about money. Don't talk about money. I'm leaving this church. Do you know the only people that leave churches over the talk of money or the people that don't give or the people that are in fear? They're like, you've talked about money. Well, here's what I can always tell you. If you ever hear anybody say, I don't go to that church because they talk about money. Just check this box off mentally, (laughs) they're in fear. Because if you hear it and you do it, you're excited to hear it again. Faith comes by hearing the word. So I'm I'm not preaching on money, but I'm preaching on who's your God and how do you really obtain success in this. So today's message is not about me being religiously right, okay? I want you to get that. My heart in this message today is not about I told you. 
And the reason is because I have to walk this out just like you. I've made mistakes in this area probably like you. Maybe some of you haven't, but this will help you if you haven't. It will help you if you have. The lie of the enemy will, what does a lie do? Typically, it deceives you. So God wants to bring healing to your today, and God wants to bring healing to your future, to your tomorrow as well, as we talk about that. Wisdom comes, what the topic we're going to talk about really works in all areas of our life. Wisdom comes only one of two ways, through the school of hard knocks, which quite honestly is what most of us have had to experience But there's a far better way, and that is by hearing the warning and the heeding of people who have been there and done that, and basically the designer, which is God, God designed the system, and to be specific with you, we're going to talk about sexuality and sex a whole lot today. Are you glad you came to church? And some people get nervous when we talk about sex in church. I, I, I just tell you this, I grew up in an environment where it was like, don't talk about it. It, You know, it's a secret thing. It's private. Don't talk about it. And yet the Bible, when I got older and began to hear the word of God addressing this topic, it's all through the Bible, all the way back in the book of Genesis, all the way to the end of the book. There's a lot of sex talk in the book. It tells the good, the bad, and the ugly of it and so there's a there's a uh, responsibility on the church to teach on this topic especially because of our culture that we live in today we we live in a culture where we need to hear about it so once again let me remind you i'm not bringing condemnation on anybody i'm bringing healing to you If you've struggled in this area, if you've been hurt in this area, if you've made some mistakes in this area, I'm here to help you heal, not hurt you, not condemn you at all. Are you with me, everybody? So when I say it's in our culture, I read this statistic and it boggled my mind a little bit because what becomes normal, I believe the enemy works in strategic ways in culture and in society what's become normal is that our TV shows. Now, this, doesn't, this stat does not even include movies, but TV shows alone. In the average year of TV shows, there are over 17,000 sexual encounters in TV shows. That's not movies included, okay? So that number goes way up in movies, 17,000. Of those 17,000, 91% of them show the sex that's happening in those to be outside of marriage. Why would the enemy do that? I, I, I believe this is why. Probably that we become numb to it, that we become dull to it, that it becomes a normal. Oh, this is just what everybody's doing it. It's just normal. I had a conversation with a Christian man last year. He argued with me because he's sleeping with a few different people. And, I mean, he was honest about that part. I appreciate that. And I'm not outing him because I'm not going to tell you his name. But he had this conversation with me. And what he was doing was he was trying to justify that it's become normal. And he said to me that hey, look, it's so prevalent. It's so everywhere. So far, I agree with him, okay? It is so prevalent. It is so everywhere that it's become normal. I even agree with that. It's become normal. However, here's where I stop agreeing. When he said, look, God has, because it's so normal, God has changed his attitude towards it. Now, this is really just now at this point, justifying an excuse for why it was okay for him to behave in this. And here's the reason he was justifying it is because he was dealing with shame and guilt associated with it. And instead of repenting in it and getting it right, he was justifying why it was okay to go ahead and continue in that. But here's the problem. Once again, not to condemn, not to beat up or not to blame. The 
problem is God has designed a system and he knows what's best for us. He's protective of us. And so, you know, as pastors, Pastor Laura and I, this is probably one of the most important messages that I'll teach this year, really. It's also one of the most uncomfortable messages, honestly, for me to teach. The reason that it is, is because I'm dealing with your heart and I want to be so ever gentle with your heart because these are the things that most people that are even struggling with it will never really talk about because of the guilt and shame associated with it. Are you all with me so far? Yeah. We were talking, and I believe in the recollection of going backwards in our mind from all these years of pastoring that I would say up in the 90 percentile range a lot of soul issues that we've dealt with with families and with people can be traced back to sex. Sexual abuse, sexual mistakes, sexual addictions, infidelities, hurt, rejection. And we have become so accustomed to it that we think that's normal. And yet, the depression, the medical addictions, the addictions to substances often are just to cover over the shame and the guilt of maybe a rape or sexual abuse or becoming very promiscuous or that list goes on and on. Okay, I want to help you get free because this may come as a surprise to you. Sex was God's idea. God invented it. And by the way, God also invented the pleasure side of it. But just like money is okay, and just like your accomplishments in life, God wants you to be successful in this life. God wants you to do what you do in your jobs or your businesses to be successful. God wants you to own a house. God wants you to, to do those things. But none of those things should become a, a, a God to us. And the lie of the enemy is that you can have all of these things and want more and crave more and lust more. And it's okay because I'm in love. It's okay. It's okay because it's a natural drive and a natural desire. I get all that. The same temptations that come at you come at me too. I get it. But I've lived long enough to see some of the consequences of this, the regret, the guilt, the shame, the mental anguish, even the mental problems, the depression. There's even one greater than all of these, and that is the autoimmune function that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7. He calls it the mind of the flesh or the mind of the body. And what happens is on a subconscious level, you have this autonomic reticular activating system within your body. You don't have to tell yourself to breathe. You don't have to tell your heart to beat. It just happens automatically. Well, there's an automatic thing that happens on the subconscious level that when you live in a condemned guilt and shameful mode and you continue to live in that because of a behavior that you've participated in over and over, or sometimes a deception in that area, the body begins to, the cells in the body have a mind of their own. And over a period of time, an autoimmune disease begins to kick in because, listen, that's why he says this leads to death. It's not that God's bringing death on anybody, your own. It's like choose you this day. The choice is yours, life or death. Choose you this day. And many times we don't realize that in the choice of the path of doing what we want, that the, the byproduct of that path is the guilt and the shame associated with it. And all of the sudden, over it seems like all of a sudden, but it wasn't all of a sudden. It was over a period of time, the body begins to eat itself up. And we have that type of thing. There's three areas of deception, I believe, that the enemy brings at us in this area first one is the animalistic action. We talk about it even in animalistic terms. The birds and the bees. You can't help yourself. You've got a drive in you. 
I know you do. It's like, you know, we're sexually powerful and we've got this drive on the inside. It's animalistic. We refer to it in the dog world. We'll stop at that, but I could go deeper with you. We even, we even understand it in the, in the natural world because how, you don't have to raise your hand, but hunters know this. Um, I enjoy hunting. I like to hunt. And deer hunting is kind of a, a, it's an art and it's a craft. And here's why it is. The fawn will walk out, but you don't want to kill a fawn. That's a little baby deer. You don't even want to really necessarily get a trophy on your wall of a doe. That's the girl, right? What you want, hunters, you want the buck that's real smart that outsmarts you that lives year after year after year because he's smart. And he has all those points. They call it, you know, I got a 12-point deer. I got a 14-point deer. What does that mean? Now, for those of you that don't hunt, you're going to learn something about hunting today. That the does and the fawns, they'll just come out in the open when you're up in that tree stand hunting. They'll just walk out there, man. They'll come right out in front of you. But the buck, he stops at the edge of the field, doesn't he, Jason? Yeah, he stops at the edge of the field and he looks. And if you're lucky, he might take a few steps out. But there's this thing called the rut. The rut is that season when she is in heat. There's a scent of sex in the air, dear sex. And all of the sudden, the buck loses his mind. He went from being a smart buck to a dumb buck. <laughs> She's around here somewhere. And he'll, he'll smell the scent of that doe and heat and he'll prance right out into that field. And all of a sudden, you have a trophy on your wall, that big old head with all those antlers up there. Come on, somebody. And I think about that and I think, you know what? When we let the animalistic drive drive us as if it's okay because we just, God made us that way, we'll end up on the wall of Satan's trophy case. The same way, same way with, I don't care what other hunting you want to do, turkey hunting or, you know, those type of things. It's the same way when they're, when, you know, that little turkey is, you're making the girl sounds. And then when you hear, <laughs> that's that male turkey talking back like, where are you at, baby girl? Where are you at? <laughs> that's the hunter squeaking this little turkey call. And, you know, if we, if we think that that is our sexual drive, we'll end up the same way, dead, and we'll be meat for, meat for Satan, you know. Because the Bible says he goes around like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. Here's the other thing. A lot of deception about this one. It's a recreational activity. This is a, I, I know this is more of a worldly philosophy. Maybe not so much in the church, but there are some in the church who have, well, it's just recreational. You know, it's just sport sex, you know, sex for sport. You know, feels good. Let's connect. Spring break sex. Don't, don't really, you know, don't remember her name, but wow, what a great night that was. And that's kind of the philosophy of some of the world. Let me move on and give you the, the third one is some people view it as an isolated event. You know, like it was only one time we were tempted. It was one time. I want to share with you some things that maybe are a little bit vulnerable, but I want you to hear them because I think it could help you. At least you'll be able to share these with your children and maybe some younger people who are coming up who are going to have these temptations because of our culture, because of what's become the norm. Several years ago, my wife and I were standing at the altar time for prayer with people. And a young girl came forward 
This has become her testimony, so I'm not sharing with you anything that's private, that she has used it as a platform for ministry today. But she came forward, and she was broken. She wept, and she wept, and she wept. And we said, are you okay? Can we pray for you? And she said, I've never had sex until just recently. And it was a one-time isolated event with a guy who was so attractive and I kind of wanted to know him. But the byproduct of that encounter was that I developed a, by medical terms, an uncurable STD that they tell me I will have for the rest of my life. I'm not in love with anybody right now. I'm not dating anybody right now. But I have experienced such guilt knowing that someday I will meet a man that I want to marry and that I'm going to have to have this conversation with him. The pain in my heart even right now, remembering the tears flowing down her face as she said, how did this happen to me? It was one time. She didn't ask that she was, she didn't ask for us to pray that she would be healed physically even. You know what she asked for? Pray that my soul would be healed. I am experiencing so much depression. I have so much pain in my life as a result of this. I need your prayers that I don't kill myself. And that brought back those memories of that moment of prayer at the altar as I was preparing this message, because the lie of the enemy is it's just recreational. It's just one time. Everybody's doing it. Listen to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter five says this in verse 15. Drink water from your own well. Share your love only with your wife. Why spill the water of your springs in the street having sex with just anyone? You should reserve it for yourselves. Never share it with a stranger. Let your wife be, uh, be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. She is a loving deer and a graceful doe. Let her, this, is, this is where the Bible gets good. Let her breast satisfy you always. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right. Don't be religious. Yeah. <laughs> May you always be captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son? This is is King David talking to Solomon. Why be captivated? By an immoral woman or fondling the breast of a promiscuous woman. For the Lord sees clearly what a man does. He examines every path that he takes. An evil man is held captive by his own sins. They are the ropes that catch him and hold him. He will die for a lack of self-control. He will be lost because of his great foolishness. Well, that's kind of a tough scripture. But the reason that I read it to you is because not, not to condemn, but to bring help and to bring healing and also to bring pleasure because there is nothing like living a shame-free, guilt free life. To be free in your own conscience is incredible. It's an incredible experience in life. So how do we break the spirit of Asherah? Asherah was a mentality that crept into the church. Maybe they watched too much TV, but maybe it was just that the enemy has always been a liar. That when he speaks, he speaks his native language. I'm going to end this up with some very, very good news for you today. This one blew me away because this was the advice of another Christian woman. But listen to this. A young girl came to Pastor Laura and myself. And the young girl said, I'm a virgin. I'm not dating anyone. But I had the weirdest conversation with another woman who is a Christian woman, older than me who told me what I probably need to do 
is go out and find a guy, lose my virginity to him, have my heart broken, and get initiated to the way the world really is. And I said, and she is a Christian? And she told us who the Christian woman was. Uh, the woman was on, I know her personally, what her struggles are. She's on antidepressant medication at a high dosage. She has a horrible lifestyle that brings much depression on her. Does she know Jesus? Is she going to heaven? Yes. But the success of her life in this world really doesn't have much fruit. And her philosophy about this, she has bought into the lie that it's okay that everybody does it and jump in and get it over with. And I thought, how painful that is that there is someone out there who is a Christian who has not renewed their mind to the truth or even understands why that it is the way that it is. See, once again, it was God who invented it, but is the enemy that perverts it and it will steal the soul. This same woman has attempted suicide on a few different times. I love her. But the very healing that she needs could be found if she would apply this theme verse we've had all throughout this. It's Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Look at what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask what paths are the old reliable paths. Ask which ways lead to a blessing. Live that way and find rest. How many of you know, boy, if you've ever lived without peace, and what I'm sharing with you today will bring you peace. First Corinthians chapter six says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them? And he's talking to this church at Corinth. He wasn't beating them up. He's saying, I wanna educate you on God's way so that you understand the true life and unite them with the prostitute because here's what they were doing. This was normal for them. They would go to church and they had the Asherah pole. How many of you know uh, what an Asherah pole is? It, the, an Asherah pole is the same thing they have at strip clubs. It's a pole. It's a sex pole. They would go to church and they would have temple prostitutes. This was a norm of their society. They thought they were coming to worship little g, God, and they would come to worship in this way. You can study the Greek history. It's no secret the way they lived. So these new believers, these new Christians who have always thought, well, this is okay, this is all good. And the reason he had to address this is because they were Christians now. They were coming to church, but they were still like, man, this sex is great. And there is pleasure in sex for a season, and sin for a season. But the byproduct of this painful is painful to the soul. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Verse 18 says this, flee from. That means run, baby. Don't try to negotiate with it. Don't, don't try. I got to manage this sex drive I've got. I got to manage it. No, you got to run. Don't try to manage it. You're not a sex manager. You're a runner. When I was a youth pastor, I used to tell them that because they would say, what do you do? What do you do? You know, I've got a girlfriend. I love her. And you know how it was when you were in high school. You'd wear the, 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 the class ring and the, the, the letterman's jacket and you cuddle up. Temptation comes because, you know, you, God made you that way. Sinful nature brings the temptation. But... You know, I mean, it's a drive that's there. And one youth pastor friend of mine told me, he said, you know what I do for my youth is I bought, uh, uh, I got them on discount because I bought multiple of them. You know, those big coffee table, those big white Bibles uh, yeah. that they're, they're like this big and they sit on your coffee table. Do they even still make those? They're probably hard to get now. But he would buy like dozens at a time. 
And when a boyfriend and girlfriend, here's what he would do. He would call them up. He'd say, Tom, I want you to bring Jenny up here. I want you guys to stand here. I want you all to pray for them because they're dating. They're going to be struggling with some temptation. And I want to present them with this Bible. And every time you guys get together, I want you to set that Bible in between the two of you. Just set it in between the two of you. This will help you remain pure. And every time you're tempted, you know, uh, they would ask him, how far is too far? That's the big question. Can I take it right up to the line? How far is too far? And boy, that's the other thing that has become so in the church world is like, well, we're not technically having sex because it's all hands or oral. I'm getting real with you, aren't I? Yeah. And so he goes, don't do anything you wouldn't do over the top of that Bible. <laughs> and they had some good testimony as a result of it. He said, flee, Paul told them, flee sexual immorality and other sins people commit are outside of the body. Every, one, one translation says, every other sin you commit is outside of the body. But this one is against your own body. This is why you have the autoimmune stuff going on. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? And you have, re you have received that from the God? You're not your own. Wait a minute. I thought I was my own man. I thought I was my own woman. No, no, no. You were bought. Yes. He owns you. Yes. <laughs> we don't like that for sure in our culture today because we like to think he gave me a free will. I could do what I want to do. And although you can rebel against him, you do belong to him. He purchased you and he bought you. Therefore, honor God with your body. I want to leave you with three things. Number one, repent. Not most, most of us think that repent means, God, I'm so sorry for the way I've lived. You probably have already done that. But the word repent means metanoia is the, the Greek word. It means to turn and go a different direction. I'm going a different direction now. Second Corinthians, same church, chapter 6, verse 17 Therefore, come out from among them and separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I'll receive you. I'll be a father to you and you'll be my son and daughter, says the Lord. So in other words, just run. Come out from among. And what he's really talking about is come out among the thought processes of it's okay. Hey, because the lie of the enemy is, hey, we love each other. So it's okay because we love each other. What the big lie that is. That's a huge lie. Well, we love each other, so it's okay if we have sex. The problem is, I can't tell you how many married couples that we've counseled with over the years who used that one because we love each other, it's okay, who are standing before us with marriage issues and marriage problems today. Mm -hmm. Trust issues today. I'll move on. Number two, this is where the blessing starts really coming in. Not only do you turn, repent, go a different direction. Number two, you receive forgiveness. Yeah. I love this about the Lord. The Lord, well, does this mean I'm condemned forever because I've messed up in this area? No, no, no. Isaiah chapter one, verse 18 talks about the Lord, his relationships with us. And, and, and it says, though your sins are like scarlet, they will be made as white as snow. Though they're red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Do you know the cool thing about God is that when you do repent and you turn from it and you come to him and receive his forgiveness to you, the grace of God, that he can take a person who has been promiscuous, who has lived a lifestyle of impurity, and he can make you brand new literally from the inside out, washing away all your sins, all the guilt and every effect in your soul of what you did in the past. I would encourage you, receive that forgiveness. Then at that point when you've received it, don't let the enemy beat you up anymore. Don't let that turn to depression because you've been forgiven. And then that leads us to the last one and that is reorder your life. In other words, put some things right how do I, because, you know, like, okay, maybe I'm not doing the one night stand anymore. Maybe I'm not doing spring break type stuff anymore. Maybe, 
You know, I'm not looking for love and acceptance through sexual gifts to other people. Maybe, maybe those are, but maybe it could be that some of us have bought into that lie that, well, we sleep together because we're going to get married someday. We sleep together. We have sex because, hey, we love each other. It's probably the biggest lie people believe is because we love each other it's okay the sex that we're having is okay and again I'm not telling you this to condemn you but I'm telling this to help you to help you reorder and fix some things so what do I do I mean we've been in the habit of of this sexual now it's an addiction to us and we do we love each other but what do we do at this point reorder here's what I'd say just reorder re just say, okay, we're going to make this right for this period of time. We're, going to, uh, we're not going to live together anymore. I'm going to move out for 30 days. I'm going to move out for 60 days. And then we we'll give ourselves 60 days. We're going to get married. Well, I'm not ready for marriage. Then break up. Break up and someday you can date again. But I'm telling you, your life matters more than your sex. sex lasts for a couple seconds compared to the soul of the people that I've stood at the altar with that have prayed please help this depression help it go away where did it come from well it all started back at this I thought this guy I thought this gal was the one that I was going to end up marrying I lived with them I gave my body to them and today they're not even in my life we grew we grew apart I hope you hear my heart. I am not against sex. I'm all for it. If you've heard me preach, you know I'm for sex. I'm pro sex. God wants you to, to enjoy it. In the confines, in the context of, and he says, hey man, when you're married to your spouse, do it. Do it often. Don't withhold it from your spouse. Give it up. Come on. I've also counseled with married couples who had one of them or both of them have had previous sexual promiscuity in their life. But once they get married, all of a sudden, Sex was always associated with guilt and shame. Now that I'm married to you, I don't want to give you any. No, I, I've counseled that many, many times. And then I've got to set with, a, set with a man who, or a woman, usually it's the men though, who says she, she just won't, she doesn't enjoy it. She doesn't like it. Now, when we were dating, she was like, oh, baby, come on. But now that it's God's permission is on it, and that's not one. That, that story is repeated a dozen times. And I'm not ever trying to embarrass anybody, but here's what I'm trying to bring healing to you, help to you. It can be good. It can be. Second Corinthians, last verse, chapter seven, verse one. Since we have these promises, God is all about promise. And I'm bringing this to a wrap with the promise of God. Dear friends, Go ahead, purify yourself from everything. Reorder that which was wrong, that which would contaminates the body and the spirit. Perfecting the holiness. How do I perfect the holiness? Just sex is holy. It's set aside for marriage. Marriage is holy. The marriage bed is holy. It's good. How do you purify yourself? Just say, you know what? That's reserved for marriage. So I'm not going to partake of that. And the promise of God. Why, do, why should I do it? Because the promises of God are so many. There's so many. And they're available to you. Repent. Just, okay, I'm going to change this. Think differently about it. Metanoia. Go ahead and receive God's forgiveness today. Go ahead and make a heart decision. I'm going to get this right. And maybe it means we move up our wedding date. 
But we're not going to live that way anymore because we don't want the pain in the future. In your notes, I put this in there. Give up, giving up something now for something later is not a sacrifice. Change your mentality. What a sacrifice. I'm going to give this up. No, no, no. It's an investment that's going to bring about a return or a harvest into your life. Here's what I speak over you, that as you give it to Jesus, as we give it to Jesus, I'm not preaching down to you, I'm preaching with you. I know all of these struggles, I know all of these pains personally. I can relate. And through my pain and my struggle personally and with those that I've helped minister to, I bring hope to you, but that hope is only found not in psychology, not in medication, not in alcohol or drugs. That hope is found in Jesus alone. Only Jesus can bring about this type of healing. So if we could, we're going to.